You are listening to the Business Society Podcast with Melissa Houston, CPA, financial strategist for CEOs, and a Forbes.com columnist. The Business Society community is where business owners come together to learn about real business, common problems, and real solutions. Are you a successful business owner who is now ready to learn how to increase your profit margins so that you can keep more money in your pocket and build your personal net worth? You are in the right place. With over 20 years of experience working with business owners, I share with you real advice that will help you increase the profit in your business and build your net worth. I know you're a genius at what you do, regardless of what profession you're in, and I'm here to help you make sense of the money and other pressing business issues. Have a business problem? We'll find real business solutions. Judy Weber is a women's business strategist and scaling expert and the founder of Judy Weber Co., a boutique consultancy for women in business. She helps six-figure female CEOs scale their business to multi-six and seven figures with simplicity using the proven joyful scaling method. A former corporate and trial attorney, as well as a C-suite executive, Judy is a genius at showing entrepreneurs how to up-level their mindset, step fully into their CEO role, and strategically transform their current business model into a freedom-based legacy business without compromising their values. She is a sought-after keynote speaker, teaching and inspiring women across the world to pursue the impossible, knowing that God is able to make your biggest dreams a reality. Hello, Judy. Welcome to the Business Society podcast. I am so happy to have you here with us today. Melissa, thank you. I'm honored to be here. Well, you have had an amazing career and you have an interesting story about where you started and how you ended up as an entrepreneur. And I would love for you to share that a little bit with the listeners, help them get to know you better, talk about where you've been and what you are doing currently. Beautiful. Okay. Well, it's quite a story. I come from very humble beginnings. I'm one of six kids. Dad was a factory worker, mom stayed home, and many times dad was working two and sometimes three jobs. So I come with a lot of that mindset baggage when I, you know, here I am day shy of 56. So that is who I am. I'm very proud of my upbringing, blue collar upbringing. My dad and my mom both taught me work ethic. I mean, it's work, you know? And so that's the good thing, Melissa, in that, hey, you work for it. You're not just going to be handed something. But the negative in that is like one thing I'm having to overcome, which we can talk about a little bit later, which is this thought or belief that in order to be successful, you got to work, work, work. And so over the years and decades, both as a lawyer, which I'll get to in a second, and as an entrepreneur, I have learned that, no, And now in my business, I want to keep everything simple, but I've left a little bit. Let me go back. So here's this little girl in this small town. And ever since I can remember, I wanted to be two things, a teacher or a lawyer. People like me, I didn't think could be lawyers, poor folk that didn't know anything and that didn't have connections. But I always had my sights on that. Went to college, first one in my family to go to college, went for music education, graduated number three in the entire class at Susquehanna University, if anybody heard that, you know, so I thought, okay, I'll easily get a job. Do you know when I got out in 87, you know, there's only so many music teachers in any one school district, unless I wanted to go out West, which I did not want to do. So anyway, if for those five years between college, graduation and law school, I worked generally in sales, first at Macy's, worked my way up to management. Then I got a little bit arrogant, maybe, and I said, you know, I'm too good for these inside sales. I'm going to go into outside sales. So that got me working ultimately for Dictaphone, which put me in front of lawyers. And I vividly remember, Melissa, walking out of this one man's law office on a Friday. And I mumbled to myself in the parking lot on the way out, this guy is an idiot. If he can do law school and do well, I can too. So at the age of, I think, 26, I decided, here I go. I'm doing it. And never good for back. you. So I got into Villanova, graduated at the top of that class, got into a really great law firm in the greater Philadelphia area where I'm from, and then got married, had my first baby. And I'm like, I don't care about partnership. I care about mm, my yes. So stayed in. When I had my third child, though, I left the private practice of law to stay home with my boys. 
Within two uh-huh. weeks, I cried to my mother, mom, how did you do this? This is harder than any <laughs> million dollar case I've had, you know, seriously. And she just laughed at me, you know, but anyway, so I'm always the type where I'm like, I love my kids. They are the most important thing and the most valuable work I could ever do. But I just felt like there was more. So and in 2003, when my kids were two, four and seven, I launched my first business, which was as an interior decorator. So I'm going to speed the rest of it. So did that for a while. Within a couple of weeks, I had more clients than I knew how to handle because I'm great at marketing, which is a good thing. But then I'm like, oh, am I going to service all these clients? Anyway, so over the years, when the kids got bigger, me and their dad divorced, went back into the law, ended up also going in-house as general counsel and head of HR, and ultimately became a coach for women in business, first specifically in real estate, and then more recently branching out to other areas. So today, I work exclusively with six-figure and multi-six-figure women, CEOs and small business owners, high-level thinkers, like high achievers with a heart to serve, predominantly in the professional services space, like firms, brokerages, and agency owners. And together, we take what they've already built, making that six-figure mark and more, and we up-level it towards seven figures. Okay, that is super interesting, and what an impressive story. So first of all, I'm very, very happy to hear that you realized that you could live up to your full potential and become that lawyer. I applaud that, absolutely. So many people sit in doubt and they don't go for it. So I love your go-getter attitude because it's true. I mean, you know, a lot of hard work, It can pay off in in those respects. But then going back to what you said, too, where it's like, you know, there's a there's this idea where there's if you want to make a lot of money that you have to work hard. We're going to get to that soon. But first, I want to ask you, you know, speaking of working hard. So getting to that sixth level point in your business, six figures, that can be interpreted as a lot of hard work. So how much harder is it go to go from six to seven figures in a business? Wow, how I love that question. I love that question, okay? And let me just start with saying something that I really want to get out. To me, in my experience, the number one success metric to get to seven figures is faith. Mm. Faith, it's the F word, right? It's (laughs) the good F word. It's that what you're doing is your life's work. It's your calling. And for me, for me as a Christian, faith in God's promises, that's the very foundation of my business. And it's interesting About 10% of women make it to six figures and only 2%, according to Forbes, will ever get to that seven figure mark. And there are several reasons for that. But to me, chief among them is a lack of strategy. And that's where I shine. Like to me, I'll give this simple example. Women overemphasize the importance of the tactic, like posting on social, for example, while they grossly underestimate the strategy behind the tactic, what I call the why, the what, and the how. Like the why, why am I doing this in the first place, right? The what, what is the goal specifically? Like, what do you hope to achieve? Is it getting more engagement? Is it getting more followers? Is it getting more consults? Like, be real specific there. And then the how is, okay, great. How can I most effectively utilize the tactic? So to me, that intentional plan to reach each thing that you do to make any activity and optimize it and make it worthwhile That's huge. So to answer, more directly answer your question, you know, is it working harder to get to seven figures? To me, it's about less is more. It is finding the gaps in your business, finding the inefficiencies in your business, and in a lot of cases, just going back to ground zero, having someone like myself, a strategist, come in to look at what you're doing, how you're doing it. I can see things that you won't be able to because you're so in the weeds. So it's really about tweaking the beautiful things you've already started and allowing that to drive your revenue like with six-figure leaps. So when you speak about strategizing, are you speaking more towards the marketing strategy or the business as a whole? Both. Both. And so there is this overarching strategy, and some call it a vision perhaps, of where's the business going? Like what is... What, what do I really hope to achieve in five years, 10 years, that kind of thing. But it's the detail. And this is what I find is lacking. And not just in women who I work with, but I know it's across the board. But we, we're such great multitaskers and we're such doers that, that it's not afraid of the doing, but we're not taking the time to get strategic and do what I say, think work. That's why, you know, in law school, they teach you how to think like a lawyer. 
And what I do is I teach my clients how to think like a CEO. Everything you do is uber strategic. Every decision is purposeful. Mm, I love that because, you know, that that's definitely something that I'm always talking about as well, where you really, as the CEO, really need to understand your business so that when you're making decisions, you're making informed decisions. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what I love what you do because too many of my clients, they're, this is kind of crazy, even when they're doing well, they avoid looking at the bank account. Yeah. Yeah. That's Just so common. Things off, right? To the bookkeeper, yeah. the accountant, and they don't really strategize and look at the data and use that as a launching pad, if you will, to really like catapult your business. So what kind of problems do your typical clients come to you with? They're working too hard. They're working too many hours. They are following what seems to be the loudest rhetoric out there. So I really want to land on this for just a moment. For one thing, I think they have too many offers. You can get to seven figures with one offer, period, the end. And when you do that, you make your life a heck of a lot easier. So what I do with my clients, I, we are intentionally creating a legacy business where you're doing important life and business changing work that really matters. And it's built on what I call a sophisticated business model. So that's like high end, unique, premium brands that stand out and they provide in-demand services. So we're talking about creating a business, kind of reverse engineering it. You're creating this business that allows you to have a lifestyle you want so that you can maintain those core values and prioritize what really matters to you, right? Whatever that is, you know, God, family, friends, serving the community. It's about not doing things the conventional way. So when you say not conventional way, like, okay, you know, being a business owner myself, I hear a lot about, you know, you need to be on the social media platforms, you need to have a podcast, you need to have a following, you need to be on a platform. I mean, like, there's just so many things that you're being told as an entrepreneur, it's almost impossible to keep up with. So what are your views on that? Wow. Well, I hate social media as much as I love it. Okay. So that makes sound weird. Okay. And it's so funny because I just did a poll inside my Joyful Scaling Facebook group and I said, I need to hear this. Do you like social media? Yes or no? And it's interesting the answers that I'm getting. And I asked them to tell me why in the comments. And across the board, they're saying, well, I guess it was kind of sort of mixed, but it was more definitely more no's than yeses. But we're tired of it. Like, I think it's a bait and switch, right? When I joined Facebook back in 08, it was like, come on, it's free. Socialize. Find your old peach from who knows where and find new people. And then somewhere along the way, then it became this profit center for them. And now it's like pay to play. So to answer your question, I'm all about simplicity in your business. I don't want you to work harder than you need to. So when I was talking about this legacy business and the sophisticated business model, if you are looking to do a membership and that's what you want to build your business on, or you want to do some sort of group program, okay, and your price point is under like $5,000 or under even $10,000 each, you're going to be working hard. You have to have a bigger following. You have to work really diligently about growing that, that following, that email list, because you need every, every week, every month to get that going so that you can make the, I mean, there are some women out there trying to make a million bucks, and it's possible, but they're trying to do it with a $50 offer or maybe a $500 offer. And that requires you to spend a heck of a lot more time reaching new people all the time. What I prefer is to say, let's start at the high end, okay? Let's make sure I'm working with women who are very experienced and can get the transformation that their people, their specific ideal clients really want so that you don't need hundreds of clients. You just need maybe a dozen. And so you can pour into them and you don't need hundreds and thousands of leads. So it's a whole different way to approach it. That's interesting. So then, I, you know, I often hear about these, these theories, but my question is, where do you find the clients? Great question. Okay. This is where, besides faith, the success metric of faith, the other one is dialing in your brand, which a huge part of that is, who the heck are you serving? So my clients, a lot of times when they come to me, when I ask that question, it's like deer in the headlights. What do you mean? Who do I work with? I will. I can help everybody. Okay, wait. I know that. That's not the question. Who do you want to work with? Who are your ideal clients? And you have to know them so intimately that you know where they are, right? So, so my client is more high-end. I'd be better served on LinkedIn than I would on Instagram, 
for example. I do have a presence on Instagram because I have a team and I'm able to do that. But I can tell you, if I were to start all over again and there were limited resources, time and money, I would definitely get uber specific about who I want to work with, interview and do the market research to know where they are, what podcasts are they listening to, get on it. (laughs) right be where they are do they want to consume video do they even have time to do it if so okay where where would they like to consume it you want to be intimately familiar i like to say obsessed with your ideal client and create a brand that serves them and stands out for them while at the same time shows authentic you yeah that makes a lot of sense so when i was talking about being unconventional i hate cookie cutter and it's funny because even as a kid If it was popular, I kind of was averse to it. It's like, oh, everybody likes Leaf Garrett. Ah, I don't like Leaf Garrett. I don't think he's cute at all, you know? So I'm all about, I work very diligent with my clients on this branding point, and it kind of makes them crazy. But you can't, like if you're a realtor, okay, I don't want to hear the same stuff. And if you're saying the same stuff everybody is, you know, I am a matchmaker. I match the perfect person with the home, or I'm a luxury, a listing agent. Great, but why are you better? I need to know why. And part of that isn't even your education or experience per se in the career or business world, but a lot of times it's the relatability. Oh, like for me, you suffered domestic violence, so did I. You know, you come from poor stock, so do I. You know, and you talk about these personal things. Storytelling is ginormous and it is so overlooked because to your point, everybody that's out there that has millions and millions of followers are telling us to be everywhere. And it's Mm -hmm. exhausting. Instead, we need to focus about who am I? And we have to get over this thing of, oh, I don't want to toot my own horn. Listen, the only way you're going to be seen out there in this sea of just oversaturated industries, whichever one you're in, is you've got to be different. And so you have to speak your story. So, okay, I love what you're saying. I really do. The question that comes to me right away is, okay, I get that. That totally makes sense about how you would separate yourself from the others. But there's so much noise in social media and just so much going on out there that people are, you know, doing these ridiculous reels and they're, you know, dancing on whatever and, you know, doing whatever just so they can actually draw in that viewer to understand how they're different. So what would you suggest to people like me who are definitely more conservative and are not interested in doing these ridiculous reels or going on TikTok and, you know, doing funny things or whatever, right? So how do you separate yourself and get noticed when you're not interested in following the crowd in that way? Okay. It's really going all in on what I've just said. And to this point, okay, I think you're amazing, Melissa. Oh, thank you. I wasn't, I wasn't fishing for a compliment, but thank you. (laughs) I know you weren't, but listen, my clients need you maybe not right away, but at some point, okay. If if you don't have a virtual CFO, someone with your level of thinking, you're missing out. Like, like you're missing out on opportunities on clients on so many different things, the profitability for sure, which is what you're known so well known for. But think about this. I hate reels. I am your ideal client. So, you know, again, we we have to stop saying so-and-so said that if I do reels, I'm going to bring in followers. If I saw you do a reel and you didn't look comfortable doing it, that wouldn't really work. And, And so I don't know that that would make me think highly of you as an expert if I didn't know you, for example. And if you didn't look comfortable doing it, I don't know. If anything, that would be a negative. So again, for me, it's about be you, be bold, right? So you don't have to dance on reels. But maybe you could do a video and turn that video into a real, you know, hire somebody from Fiverr or somebody on your team to take what you're already doing in the content you're already putting out there and put it in a real format and in a way that really aligns with your brand. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because you're still being true to who you are, but you're putting out the information that people want to see. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So are you offering clients like a specific methodology that you work with them on? Yes. And this is a a real life example of what I was talking about as far as setting yourself apart. We need to create IP, intellectual property for our companies. And we have to stop thinking small. We have to really think big. 
And so I absolutely have my own methodology. I call it the joyful scaling method, the joyful scaling method. And it follows the acronym of joy because I am so adamant about having joy in your business because we're not having joy. Why in the world are we doing this, right? So the J stands for jumpstart. Here we, you know, look at your marketing strategies and your sales strategies and together we tear them apart to rebuild them. Kind of it's a jump start, but first we have to take a pause and evaluate. Okay, that's the jump start. The O is optimize. Now that we've dialed in your strategies, now it's time to optimize. So here we look at things like systems, automation, and also team building. Because I know many of my clients have hired and they've been big fails. And that's okay. And then, but that makes them gun shy. So I want to work with them to say, all right, let's set out your org chart. Okay, you're talking about vision casting and where is this business going? So let's set out that org chart and let's talk about roles and responsibilities and map it out. When are we going to hire who? That's the O, optimization. And then the Y is yield. And here is kind of along your bailiwick where we look at the results, but not just the numbers. Let's look at deliverability. Let's look at the client journey and the successes and the testimonials and the, you know, we're wanting to provide a transformation. Do your clients get the transformation? What's the percentage? How can we help them? So through the joyful scaling method, that allows you to look at the very important parts of the business now that you've, a, you know, you've reached a certain point. So it's all about how can we turn this up and leverage everything we're doing to be able to reclaim our time and really take the business to seven figures. Oh, I love that. That's a great strategy. Great methodology there. Is there a specific download or offer that you have for oh, listeners? Well, thank you for that. Yes, I would actually love to offer your listeners what I call the ultimate scaling guide for proven strategies for exponential growth. So if you go to my website, it's still in progress, but you can find that at judyweber.co and you can download that ultimate scaling guide for free. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm sure that will definitely provide a lot of value for listeners. So it's been such a great conversation with you today, Judy. I've really learned a lot from you. If there's one thing that you would want listeners to take away from this today, what would that be? I would have to say, think bigger. Ooh, have, I like that. Yeah, think bigger. I really, as I talk to women, and I meet some powerhouse women, as I'm sure you do, Melissa, and the thing that always astounds me is it's almost like at the end of every great accomplishment, there's almost like a, whole, a pullback. There's almost like when you give someone a compliment, oh, thanks, but this is just a, you know, I just picked this up on the sale rack or, oh, that was no big deal, you know? So ladies, everyone listening, think bigger and go for it. Mm, I love that. I love that because I'm huge on thinking big too. So you've definitely inspired me today. <laughs> Great. Awesome. <laughs> We're mission accomplished. <laughs> so I know you gave that valuable information on where we can find your, your methodology, but if listeners want to reach out to you in another way, how can they find you? Great question. I am at Judy Weber Co. everywhere. LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, the work. So at Judy Weber Co. and I would love to connect with you. Perfect. And we're going to leave those links in the show notes. So Judy, I cannot thank you enough for coming on today and sharing your wisdom with us. It's truly been a pleasure. Thank you, Melissa. It's been a joy. Thanks for listening to the Business Society podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, leave us a review. Your ratings and reviews help more people like you find our podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and share this podcast with someone you think would love it. Until next time, I'm Melissa Houston. And never forget, nobody will ever care about your money as much as you do. So never give your financial power away.